This is the missing link that we have been searching for when trying to understand mental disorders. It is so obvious. It has been hiding in plain sight. And we have over a century of scientific data to support this. And I know of dozens and dozens and dozens of patients who are putting their chronic, lifelong, life-threatening mental disorders into full, lasting remission. Chris, at this point in history, we're in the middle of a mental health crisis. What do you think is at the root of this? So at the end of the day, I am asserting based on decades and decades of science that mental disorders are in fact metabolic disorders of the brain. And so at the same time that we see skyrocketing rates of obesity, prediabetes, and diabetes, I am arguing that the brain is being affected in the same ways that people's weight and people's glucose and insulin systems and people's hearts are being affected. I'm arguing that the brain is being affected as well. And that is largely why we are seeing skyrocketing rates of mental disorders. Well, before we get in the weeds here, let's talk about what metabolism is and then what's the physiology that's happening there in the brain. So most people think of metabolism as burning calories and they think of it as it largely relates to your weight. And if you have a high metabolism, you're going to be thin no matter what really no matter what you eat. And if you have a low metabolism, then you're going to be fat no matter how little you eat. And there is truth in that. Metabolism is, in fact, about burning calories. But I am here to say it is so, so, so much more than that. Metabolism is actually fundamental to the definition of all living organisms It is the process of taking food and oxygen, for example, and turning it into ATP uh, or energy. It's also involved in making building blocks for cells that are used to maintain and grow cells. And it also involves the the management of waste products as, as, uh, as part of that process. Okay, let's relate that specifically to the brain. So when that starts to fail, let's go right to that organ and talk about what the physiology that's happening there. You know, when you ask a common sense question, what causes mental illness? Most people, most neuroscientists today will say, gosh, no one knows. It's really complicated. The brain is a really complicated organ. And all we know are some risk factors. We know about Um, biological, psychological, and social risk factors. So we know about neurotransmitters and hormones and inflammation in the brain, but we also know about genetics and epigenetics because these things run in families. And we also know that psychological and social factors play a role. Trauma, stress, adverse childhood experiences, all of these things play a role in mental illness. So exactly how they come together to cause mental illness up until now has really been a mystery. And that has really prevented the mental health field from developing more effective treatments. And that is in part why we see skyrocketing rates of mental disorders. What I am arguing is that if you look at the big picture, if you look at all of those risk factors at the exact same time and try to put them all together in one coherent way, we can finally, finally do that. And that is because there has been an explosion of research over the last 20 years, primarily in the fields of metabolic health, and in the field of aging, you know, what causes people to age prematurely, what causes animals and other living organisms to age. We have made tremendous progress in those fields. And what I have done is largely borrowed or 
synthesized, integrated a lot of that scientific literature with everything that we know in the mental health field and put it together to argue that the only way to understand mental disorders is through metabolism. And, uh, and more specifically, these tiny things in our cells called mitochondria. In a nutshell, what I'm arguing is that mental disorders represent the brain malfunctioning. They represent parts of the brain either being overactive, underactive, or having absent functions, either because the parts of the brain did not develop properly, which we usually call neurodevelopmental disorders, or parts of the brain actually might shrink and die. And we usually call those neurodegenerative disorders. But in fact, you can put that all together by understanding metabolism and mitochondria. And they are, in fact, the only way to help us see the big picture of what causes the brain to malfunction. Would it be fair to say in its simplest form, what we're talking about here is we have this outbreak, for lack of a better word, of mental disorders Below that, we have metabolic dysfunction, and the piece that's affecting the dysfunction, or to even go further down from there, we're talking about the mitochondria and things not working properly with those. Yes. I I would actually put mental disorders under metabolism in a way. So metabolism is kind of the definition of a living organism. If a, if a living organism is not doing metabolism, it is not alive anymore. And that is, in fact, what causes death. So I would put metabolism at the top, and then mental disorders represent a dysfunction or a dysregulation of metabolism. It's not an all-or-nothing thing, because if it was all-or-nothing, the organism would be dead. Um, so, But cells can exhibit metabolic dysfunction. And if you ask the big picture question, well, what does that mean? That's where you have to go to mitochondria to understand what that means. And just to tease this totally apart while we're in the weeds here, is it possible to have a problem with metabolism independent of the mitochondria, or are they always involved? So this is not a widely um, held consensus. Right now, if you ask researchers, what does it mean to have a metabolic disorder? Or if you even ask researchers a really basic common sense question, how is it that obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease fit together? How precisely, physiologically, how does obesity result in a heart attack? How does obesity result in type 2 diabetes? And what does type 2 diabetes have to do with heart attacks? Now, one term that a lot of people have probably heard of is one, one phrase that people will use to explain all of that is insulin resistance. And there's a large number of people who've written many books saying that insulin resistance is the definition of a metabolic problem or a metabolic disorder, and insulin resistance can explain all of those connections. But in fact, insulin resistance alone cannot explain all of those connections. Insulin resistance is a very complicated thing. I am asserting that, in, and actually it's based on a tremendous amount of science. If you actually get into the details of science, insulin resistance is simply a symptom of metabolic dysfunction and if you get into the weeds, the scientific weeds, the cell biology weeds of, well, what exactly does insulin resistance mean? What does it really mean? You must get to mitochondria and mitochondrial dysfunction. Because in fact, you know, even on that particular point, mitochondria are actually primarily responsible for sensing the amount of glucose in the human body and in human cells. Mitochondria play a direct role in releasing and regulating insulin. Mitochondria play a role in utilizing glucose. And mitochondria play a role in 
transporting insulin receptors to the cell membrane and allowing insulin to actually work. So there's no way around it. You can't talk about insulin resistance without talking about mitochondria. The reason I prefer to talk about mitochondria as opposed to insulin resistance is because insulin resistance falls short in many ways. It does not explain everything that we need to explain. It does not explain all of the biological factors that play a role. It does not at all explain the psychological and social factors that play a role in mental illness and also metabolic illnesses. So if we go a little bit deeper, if we are more precise in what we are talking about and how we are defining metabolic dysfunction, that is when we can finally, once and for all, connect all the dots. For the purposes of our conversation, using metabolic dysfunction or mitochondrial dysfunction, can we use those as synonyms to mean the same kind of thing? Or or is there some intricacy with what we're going to be getting into? I think that is a fair enough generalization. <clears throat> Might there be some nitpicky exceptions to that rule? Maybe. But for the most part, I think those terms are synonymous. Mitochondrial dysfunction equals metabolic dysfunction or dysregulation. Well, let's talk more about what the mitochondria are and what they do. You got into a nuanced piece there when you're talking about insulin, blood sugar. But since this is going to be a cornerstone of our conversation, let's talk about them in a general sense for people that might not be familiar or at least what the nuances are of them. And then we can use that to springboard off and get into other details. Absolutely. So I am a mental health professional, and I just listed off a little bit ago the biopsychosocial mo model and some of the factors that we know play a role in mental illness. And interestingly, you can connect all of those dots through mitochondria. So most people know mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cell. That means they take in food and oxygen and they turn it into ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. There is no doubt they do that and they are the powerhouses of the cell. But mitochondria do so much more than that. Mitochondria actually play a direct role in the production, regulation, and release of neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, uh, GABA, and acetylcholine. Mitochondria play a direct role in the production, regulation, and release of some really important hormones that everyone's heard of, cortisol, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone. Mitochondria play a direct role in the regulation of gene expression in the cell nucleus. They are the primary regulator of what's called epigenetics, or the expression of different genes at different times. Um, including during neurodevelopment, so that starts to get into neurodevelopmental disorders. Mitochondria play a direct role in inflammation, turning it both on and off. And here's a little bit of shocking news to a lot of people. Mitochondria play a direct role in the human stress response. When humans are stressed, either physically or psychologically, mitochondria are regulating the stress response. They are regulating the cortisol release, the inflammation that occurs. They are regulating the release of adrenaline, and they are also regulating the expression of genes in the hippocampus in particular. I'll stop there. Mitochondria do so many things. And, uh, you know, for, so for some researchers who are really familiar with this field, they're going to say, well, yeah, mitochondria are doing kind of everything. So what? You know, you're kind of going awfully high up. Like when we talk about seeing the forest from the trees, they're like, they might say, you're, you're talking about the whole forest, Chris Palmer. And I'm going to say, duh, yeah. <laughs> like, like if we really want to understand the forest and the trees, we have to see the whole forest. That is the point. There's no way around it. Um, and there's no way around this theory that mental disorders are metabolic disorders of the brain. It is so obvious. It has been hiding in plain sight. And we have over a century of scientific data to support this. 
Well, the fact is, you know, you talked about how mitochondria do everything. That is the the essence of your theory, what everything stands on. The fact that all mental illness has this common thread that comes back to the mitochondria at its most core piece. So that's why this all works. Exactly. Exactly. And and you know, I've I've talked with one or two researchers who've actually said, well, you know, but mitochondria do everything. So I don't, I'm not feeling good about this assertion or this theory. And this is from even researchers who have tried to assert what I'm asserting, that mitochondria are the common pathway to mental illness. Um, and, and they've been confused by that or thought that maybe they haven't really discovered a whole lot. And what I'm here to say is, no, actually, this is, this is the missing link. This is the missing link that we have been searching for when trying to understand mental disorders, when trying to understand things like why do people with mental illness also have all sorts of physical disorders? Why are they more likely to have migraine headaches? Why are they more likely to have seizures? Why are they more likely to have pain disorders? Why are they more likely to have gastrointestinal disorders like irritable bowel syndrome? Um, why are they more likely to have thyroid disorders? Why are they more likely to die early deaths? Why are they more likely to have heart attacks, develop obesity, develop diabetes? This is the only way to understand all of those well-known, well-documented observations. And I would argue this is a good thing for people that are suffering because it simplifies everything, right? Up until this point, you know, it's been so confusing when we get into the psychological world or psychiatric world with the DSM and having different diagnoses and different symptoms under each and, and trying to figure out exactly what a person fits under and a specific treatment plan. When it comes down to fixing metabolic health, it just simplifies the whole process and lets us take a big sigh of relief and say, okay, we know where this is coming from and whatever your unique symptoms are, we're going to approach it this way. Yes, that is the beauty of this. Um, and it's the beauty of the treatments that I'm implementing in real patients. I want to make clear, this is not theoretical. So at the same time that I'm helping somebody overcome their schizophrenia, I'm also helping them lose weight. I'm also helping prevent a heart attack in them. I'm helping them become more athletic, have a greater ability to exercise. But it's not just physical. It is all of those physical things. And obviously, those are so critically important. And I, you know, I, I don't want to minimize that. Or, but it's also psychological and social. I'm at the same time, I'm helping these people develop meaningful lives, connect with other humans, have something useful to do with themselves, have a purpose in life. All of those things matter too. We're going to take a, a lot of time later on in our conversation, get into treatment, what people can do. But before that, there's a lot more nuance to what we're discussing now that I think it's important we set the stage with. Next piece being... You know, we know that everything comes back to this common source when it comes to different psychiat psychiatric disorders, but why are the symptoms different then? I'll start with an easy example. So diabetes is a metabolic disorder. Um, and most people think of diabetes as, you know, oh, well, you, maybe you need insulin or you need pills for your blood sugar. Diabetes is high blood sugar. That's what that is. Well, in fact, eh, not really. Um, I mean, for some people, if you want to think about it in that simplistic way, that's fine. But that's not at all scientifically accurate. Diabetes is a metabolic disorder. It means that the cells in your body are having trouble with mitochondrial function. And that means they are having trouble with energy production and regulation. And that it is a disruption in metabolism throughout your brain and body. And people with diabetes, though, can have different risk factors, different things that are making their diabetes worse or better. And people with diabetes can be wildly different from each other. Some people with diabetes can control it 
with diet and exercise and have relatively few symptoms otherwise. It can look and function pretty normally and pretty healthy. Um, but other people with diabetes can actually develop widespread, horrible consequences of their metabolic disorder. They can have kidney problems, liver problems, gastrointestinal problems, brain problems, including mental illnesses, but also neurological illnesses. They can have eye problems. They can lose their eyesight. They can have nerve problems and develop chronic pain. Um, they can have all sorts of things. And in the so two people with diabetes can have wildly different symptoms, can have different organs affected. And on one hand, to understand why are they different, we need to look at specific risk factors and what's going on and why are they different. And so it gets really complicated. If you're a scientist and you really want to understand at the cellular level, why does this person have kidney problems and the other one doesn't? It starts to get really complicated and you can get lost in those weeds. But if you take a step back and acknowledge both of these people have diabetes, and I can address all of the symptoms that these people are having, including their liver problems, kidney problems, GI problems, nerve problems, everything. I can address all of those by simply implementing an effective diet, <laughs> having this person exercise, making sure this person gets adequate sleep, on and on. So you can develop a metabolic treatment plan to address all of those things. So at the end of the day, I know your real question was, so why do people with mental disorders have different symptoms? Why does one person have schizophrenia? Another person has bipolar. Another person has depression. Another has OCD. Another has alcoholism. Why would they be different? Well, at the end of the day, in the same way that I just described the complexity of diabetes and how different people can have different symptoms and different organs affected, the brain is a really complex organ, as everyone knows, and it's got different regions of the brain that do different things. And depending on which regions of your brain are metabolically compromised, and some will be more metabolically compromised than others, depending on which regions are affected, you will exhibit different symptoms. So if the, if the regions of your brain that control depression symptoms are metabolically compromised, you might have unrelenting depression for no good reason. If the regions of your brain that control OCD symptoms are metabolically compromised, you might have obsessive compulsive disorder. Whereas another person might start having hallucinations, another person might have manic episodes every now and then. But uh, that is the general theme. But again, the great news is it kind of doesn't matter where the symptoms are or how they're presenting themselves. I mean, in some cases it will, and we might need to use specific treatments to keep people safe or to help reduce symptoms in the short run. But if we take the larger, bigger approach, just like I said with diabetes, we can help people overcome chronic mental disorders using metabolic treatment strategies. The thing that's really important to stress about this theory is that what I'm arguing is that mental disorders are metabolic disorders. And the reason I chose that term as opposed to saying mental disorders are mitochondrial disorders, they're, they're, they mean different things. And, and the difference is that, so somebody can have a metabolic problem because they either have insufficient or malfunctioning mitochondria in a cell. And if they have insufficient or malfunctioning mitochondria, that cell is metabolically compromised. But we can also cause metabolic problems through the environment. And that means I could give someone, so somebody could be perfectly healthy, robustly healthy. If I suffocate them, they're going to die. Before they die, they're probably going to have some symptoms. Um, that, <clears throat> if you suffocate somebody slowly, like with carbon monoxide poisoning, or if you slowly but surely decrease the oxygen in the air available, 
that person will actually start developing all sorts of mental symptoms. They'll start hallucinating. They'll get confused. They might get agitated. They might get quiet and depressed. They, they can have all sorts of things as their brain begins to malfunction. <clears throat> but the root cause of that is the environment because we need oxygen. Some other extreme examples of environment are people can overdose on alcohol and that can poison mitochondria specifically. Um, their mitochondria could have been perfectly happy and healthy, um, but the environment became hostile to them. Temperature can influence metabolism. Um, all sorts of things can influence metabolism. So uh, at the end of the day, all of those environmental things are adversely affecting mitochondria and mitochondrial function or preventing mitochondria from doing what they should be doing. So I'm sticking with my the thing I said before, which is, in a nutshell, metabolic dysregulation or dysfunction is about mitochondrial dysregulation or dysfunction. But it's not always that the person has, quote unquote, unhealthy mitochondria. Sometimes it's the environment became hostile to those mitochondria very quickly with things like suffocation or heat stroke or freezing to death, like literally freezing to death or um, things like that. I think at this point, it'd be helpful to give an example from your book. And there's a really powerful one you give in the intro with Tom back in 2016 for the viewers and listeners to get an idea of, in a practical sense, what we're talking about now, how that can play out. Yeah. So. Um, so Tom had been a patient of mine for over eight years. He's a 33-year-old man with what's called schizoaffective disorder, which is a cross between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And he was tormented by his mental symptoms. He had hallucinations every day. He had paranoid delusions. He was terrified to go out in public convinced people were trying to hurt him or they were talking about him. He was convinced people had these technologies that they could beam his thoughts to other people or they could put thoughts in his head. Um, <clears throat> Tom had tried over 17 different medications. None of them stopped his hallucinations and delusions, but they did cause him to gain a tremendous amount of weight. And at some point, he asked for my help to lose weight, and we decided to try the ketogenic diet. Within two weeks, not only did Tom start losing weight, but I started to notice a really powerful antidepressant effect in him. He was, he was actually making better eye contact, smiling more, talking a lot more in a way that I had never seen. <clears throat> but he was still having hallucinations and delusions. It was about two months into the treatment. So he was on the diet for two months losing even more weight. And he started to spontaneously report to me that his long-standing hallucinations were going away. His paranoid delusions were also starting to go away. He actually started to recognize that they probably had never even been true. Like when he would hear himself saying it out loud, he, he's like, gosh, now that I say that, it sounds crazy. And maybe maybe I've had schizophrenia all along. You know, for the longest time, he didn't believe he had schizophrenia. He thought these things were really happening to him, that people really were tormenting him or, you know, targeting him. And <clears throat> it was impossible to convince him otherwise. He was just convinced, this is reality. Why won't anyone believe me? Why won't they take me seriously? I'm not schizophrenic. Um, I get that other people are schizophrenic, but I'm not. And why won't people take me seriously? <clears throat> and now he started to recognize, oh my God, maybe I've had schizophrenia all along because this doesn't sound even reasonable or rational. Tom went on to lose what's now 160 pounds and has kept it off to this day six years later. But much, much more importantly, Tom was able to do things he hadn't been able to do since the time of his diagnosis. He was able to go out in public and not be paranoid complete a certificate program. He was able to perform improv in front of a live audience, move out of his father's home for a time. Um, and that completely upended everything that I knew as a psychiatrist. 
Because number one, diet is not supposed to help something like schizoaffective disorder, number one. Number two, schizoaffective disorder is not supposed to go into remission. It's not supposed to get better. We tell people this is a lifelong disorder. You're going to have this forever, even with the best treatments we have to offer. Even with the best pills we have, the majority of people will continue to have symptoms and be tormented by their symptoms. And uh, that kind of set off a whole new phase of my career. So for Tom, he lost a lot of weight, his mitochondrial health improved, and his symptoms came down and improved. At the time that I was doing this treatment, I had no idea why Tom got better. Um, and so Tom's story, along with numerous others now, so Tom is not a single isolated anecdote. Um, I am now well aware of at least over 100 people who have been able to put their chronic depression, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia into remission. Um, and... So I went on this deep dive to understand how did this work? How can we understand it? And uh, and at the end of the day, the conclusion I have come to is what you said, that the ketogenic diet can improve mitochondrial health and the number of mitochondria in cells, and that can result in the brain functioning normally again And that can help people heal and recover from chronic mental disorders. You said something there I want to make sure we get into and discuss the fine detail. It improves the mitochondrial health. And I think you said it improves the the number, increases the number of mitochondria. So I think it's important we talk about, there's two different aspects. It's not just about fixing them. There's, There's nuance to that. So can you talk about why both of those are important? Yeah. So, you know, it is... Well established, and again, this is where this is where we start to unite the mental health field with the aging field and the metabolic health field and so many other fields of medicine. Um, it is well established, and it has been known for a long time, that metabolism and metabolic rate and mitochondria play an instrumental role in the aging process, and all of the aging-related diseases. So there are diseases and disorders that are considered aging diseases, and those include the metabolic disorders that we're talking about. They include weight gain or obesity. People tend to gain weight as they get older. Young kids, at least in the old days, were almost never overweight or obese. That's changing now, which is tragic, and uh, we can get into that if you want. But um, the other age-related diseases are type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, heart attacks and strokes, but also things like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. All of those are age-related diseases. And we know that as people age, the mitochondria in their cells become more less and less healthy. Um, and that's usually coined mitochondrial dysfunction. And the number of mitochondria in the cells also declines. And so it's both of those things, is that the cells have fewer and fewer mitochondria, and the mitochondria that are there become increasingly unhealthy. And the working assumption throughout numerous medical specialties is that if a cell has enough mitochondria, and if those mitochondria are healthy and functioning properly, that cell will be thriving. That cell will have optimal health. And so there are two processes that play a key role in all of this. And those are called, one is called mitophagy, which is getting rid of old defective mitochondria and replacing them with new ones. And then there's another process called mitochondrial biogenesis, which basically just means the production of more mitochondria. So um, we can stimulate both of those processes, mitophagy, mitochondrial biogenesis, through lots of lifestyle strategies. 
and they're they're familiar to everyone. Like this is science. It's nerdy. Most of you probably are like, "What the hell is this guy talking about?" <laughs> um, but things like diet, exercise, good sleep, avoiding drugs and alcohol, all support your mitochondrial health. So at the end of the day, I'm talking about nerdy, detailed science, but what I'm really saying is common sense health and wellness solutions in very clear, detailed ways. So it's not, I'm not sitting here promising everybody go out and eat some broccoli and you'll cure your schizophrenia. That's not at all what I'm saying, folks. But what I'm saying is that if you understand the detailed science, you can develop very specific, detailed dietary strategies, exercise strategies, sleep strategies, substance use strategies, medication strategies to fix your metabolic health, and that will fix your mental health, and that will help you be happier and healthier. This is more good news for people. When we were talking about before the fact that it all stems down to mitochondria, that was good news because, you know, it doesn't matter what your mental illness is, we're going to approach it from the same way. But now you're saying a lot of the things that we're going to talk about when we get into treatment are going to be things that a lot of people that are already adopting a healthy lifestyle have probably heard about or taken on already. And it's not going to be overly complicated. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the one of the beautiful things about this theory is that it simply connects the dots, provides the scientific missing links to confirm what millions of people already know. I have people coming to me out of the woodwork all around the world who say, I had crippling depression for years. I tried all these pills. I tried all this psychotherapy. Nothing, nothing helped me. And then guess what? I went on a paleo diet and I started exercising and I got off those pills and everything got better. And I am a new person. And psychiatrists won't believe me. Psychiatrists won't believe that diet and exercise or healthy lifestyle helped me heal my chronic depression. And you're kind of proving why my experience was true, why it was valid, what, that I, it really wasn't just in my head. I'm not crazy for thinking that diet and exercise cured me um, because it did cure me. And I can tell you, I have heard from thousands and thousands of people like that, <clears throat> especially people who are reading the book, and then they're saying, oh my gosh, these are all the strategies or these are some of the strategies that I tried, but now I even know about some other ones that I didn't even think about or didn't know about, and now I can even maybe improve my health even more, or, you know, I was 90% of the way there, now I want to get, a, you know, to 100%. So, in some ways, this is just confirming what is so obvious. As I said, it's been hiding in plain sight. Um, and... uh but it offers an entirely new paradigm because what we're doing tragically is not working. When people have crippling depression or anxiety or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or alcoholism, and they go to a psychiatrist and just get pill after pill after pill, that is not working. And, and in fact, that might actually be doing harm, and at least in some cases. And this offers strategies that are available today to help people heal and recover. Let's stick on this medication piece. I noticed when you were telling Tom's story, you talked about the fact that he was taking these drugs and it was causing him to gain weight. So right away when you were saying that, it popped into my head, well, it sounds like he's destroying his metabolic health by taking these, which is going to lead to, at least in a certain way, flaring up his mental health symptoms. But this is obviously a nuanced thing because these drugs are helping some people. So what I'm getting at here is, let's talk about it from the standpoint I just did, Tom and, and other people that are gaining weight and what that's doing. And then other nuanced examples of different drugs and how they're impacting the common thread here, which is the mitochondria. Before I get started on this topic, I just have to 
put out a disclaimer and warning that I'm going to say some things that might, if, if any of you are taking any of these medications or if you know loved ones who are taking these medications, which I am certain a lot of your listeners will because everybody knows somebody, um, that it is imperative that people not stop their medications on their own. Um, stopping psych medications abruptly is a recipe for disaster. I need to say that numerous times, but I, I will say it one more time. Stopping your psych meds on your own can result in horrible, out-of-control depression, mania, psychosis, suicidality, death. You may die if you stop your meds cold turkey on your own. So please do not do that even though what I'm going to say is going to make you want to stop your meds, possibly. <laughs> so with that warning, so it's, it's not that I'm against getting people off their meds. I just want people to do it safely with medical supervision because it can be a long, slow, painful process to try to get off meds. That is just the reality. With that said, this was actually one of the stumbling blocks for me early on in developing this theory is I'm, I've been a psychiatrist for over 27 years. I am well aware that psychiatric meds cause metabolic harm. It's right on the package inserts. This pill can cause weight gain. This pill can cause type 2 diabetes. This pill can cause cardiovascular disease. This pill can cause premature mortality, at least in the elderly. It is right there on the package inserts. I've known that all along. And as I was developing this theory, that was, it really was one of the major stumbling blocks for me, is that I had to try to understand that. So why would these pills work then? If my theory is correct, if metabolic problems in cells is the cause of mental illness, why would harming metabolism be helpful? That doesn't make any sense at all. And at the end of the day, it comes down to a bit of a paradox for a metabolically compromised cell. When a cell is metabolically compromised, I, I kind of outline five broad things that can happen to those cells, depending on when and where and how you know, it is metabolically compromised and where it's at in its developmental cycle. Um, but two of them are critically important, and, and they account for the overarching majority of symptoms of mental illness. So if a cell is metabolically compromised, it can actually become underactive, which means it, it, the simplest way to think about it is the cell doesn't have enough energy, so it's just not going to work as well. It may not be completely shut off, but it might be a little sluggish. It's kind of like putting a dimmer switch on the light bulb. The light bulb just isn't doing quite what it should be doing. Or it's kind of like if you're if the battery to your car is get is starting to die, but it's not 100% dead, some things might work in the car and other things may not work. Or the lights might be dim, but maybe the starter doesn't fully start anymore but some things are kind of working. So underactive cells, but here's the paradox. When a cell is metabolically compromised, it can also become hyper excitable, meaning it can become overactive. And that overactivity or hyper excitability actually accounts for a lot of the symptoms of mental illness. It's not all of the symptoms, some of the symptoms of mental illness are due to underactive cells, while other symptoms of mental illness, such as an anxiety attack or a hallucination or delusion, those are due to hyper-excitable cells in the brain. <clears throat> and that is the paradox. So one single cell, metabolically compromised, could be underactive 90% of the time and then could be hyper-excitable 10% of the time. That same cell 
basically, in a nutshell, becomes erratic in its ability to function. Sometimes underactive, sometimes overactive. But if we're lo- if we're targeting overactive symptoms or hy- symptoms of hyperexcitability, one way to stop a cell from being hyperexcitable is to basically shut the cell down altogether. If we really suppress metabolism in that cell, if we really suppress mitochondrial function in that cell, it won't function at all. And that will prevent hyperexcitability. The problem is that over the long run, you're actually making that cell weaker. You're making that cell even more metabolically compromised. And that means over time, that person may develop a chronic, progressive mental illness. It means that those cells may become even weaker, even more metabolically compromised, and therefore even more prone to malfunctioning. Um, You can't kill all of the cells. Obviously, the easiest way to stop symptoms would be to kill the cells, but that means death. A dead person does not have symptoms of mental illness because they don't have any symptoms. But that's not the goal of treatment, and it's certainly not the goal of restoring people's lives. When you were talking there about the fact that when a cell is metabolically unhealthy, it can become dampened in its response or overexcited, is more good news than this, and I'm assuming it must be, the fact that when we use the natural way of going about regaining that metabolic health, that'll balance out either way the way it needs to? At the end of the day, the the long-term goal is precisely that, that if we can restore metabolic health, it means that we can get all of the cells in the brain and body rebalanced. We can get an appropriate number of mitochondria and all of the different cells, and those mitochondria will be functioning properly, and this will become a well-oiled machine once again which means that the human body will work, it will work as as designed, and it will do what it's supposed to do, and that means no brain malfunction, no symptoms of mental illness. I have to warn you and, and your listeners, when we implement treatments that increase energy in cells, when we implement treatments that give your cells more energy, Early on, that can result in even more symptoms. It can result in these hyper-excitable symptoms, unfortunately. And that can make treating patients, especially patients with really serious mental disorders, like hallucinations, delusions, suicidality, it can make treating these patients a little bit complicated at times, sometimes dangerous because those symptoms are dangerous. It's not because the treatments are dangerous, but it's because those symptoms are dangerous. And if the treatment might provoke some of those symptoms, we need to understand that. We need to warn patients and family members about that. And we need to come up with safety plans for people. We need to make sure people are going to be safe while they are implementing these treatments. So I I have to put that disclaimer I'm not here, again, I'm not here to say go out and eat broccoli and that'll cure everyone's schizophrenia because that's not at all what I'm saying. And I'm also not saying go out and do one or, you know, everybody exercise and that'll cure everyone and it'll all be good. It's, unfortunately, it's not that simple, but it is much simpler than most people realize. It is doable, it is implementable, but I really do want people to, for people who have really serious life-threatening symptoms, I really do want people to work with their healthcare providers to to make sure this gets done in a safe way. That makes a lot of sense. And for somebody who say has that step back before they take too forward type what you mentioned there, how long would that typically last? Are we talking a couple of weeks, a couple of months? 
just to give people a heads up of what they might be looking at if they are somebody in that severe case right now and they're looking to pivot and do things differently. So this is what I do for a living. I, I treat p- patients with serious, usually life-threatening, treatment-resistant mental disorders. So this is kind of my bread and butter. And the good news is that as long as the clinician understands what he or she is doing, as long as that clinician warns the patient, okay, here's what we're looking for. We're going to implement this treatment. Let's say we're going to change your diet, or we're going to start an exercise plan, or we're going to try to re-regulate your sleep. Or we're even going to start a medication or something that might be helpful. Um, that here are the warning signs. Here are the things that I'm going to be worried about. If you should develop any of these symptoms, let me know, and and then together we will assess and we'll come up with a plan. All of these treatments can easily, you know, if you start a diet, for instance. And within three days, something really bad is happening. You can always stop the diet. That's the easiest solution. So we're not talking about people going on for weeks or months with serious life-threatening symptoms. We're usually talking about a day or two um, in which people might have a setback. People might notice an increase in symptoms. But it's important that, again, the clinician and the person have a plan in place to manage those symptoms and deal with them. And uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, when that happens, it doesn't mean I give up on diet. It just means, well, let's maybe try a different version. Let's ease you into it a little more gradually, or let's do a different treatment first, and then we'll come back to diet. So, I mean, there are lots of ways to get around that. Um, And at the end of the day, although I'm saying, yeah, there's some nuance to this, yes, there's some sophistication to this, and there is, I'm also saying, and I know of dozens and dozens and dozens of patients who are putting their chronic, lifelong, life-threatening mental disorders into full, lasting remission. So this is doable. There are lots of people who are doing it. They are alive. They are telling their stories. This stuff is really happening. That's incredible. And while we're in the realm of talking about medication, it gets me thinking about antibiotics. And this isn't something that is typically you know, used to treat people with mental illness. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because, again, that common thread of our conversation is the mitochondria. And a common theory right now is that those mitochondria are bacteria that have been engulfed by, by uh, another cell early in our evolution. So where I'm coming with all this, if we if the mitochondria are in essence at the central theme of, of fixing people when they're suffering mentally, and if we're giving somebody an antibiotic that could potentially, that is, is designed to kill bacteria, what happens with the mitochondria in our cells? Because those are, in theory, bacteria that have been engulfed. It's a really important observation um, that I did not get into in detail in the book because I just ran out of space to include this part, but it's a great observation on your part. And bottom line is different antibiotics, some antibiotics can cross the blood-brain barrier more easily than others. So some can't cross the blood-brain barrier at all. So there are going to be differences in different types of antibiotics Some are going to very easily get into cells and others will not very easily get into cells. So so there are all those differences. But what we do know with certainty, um, or at least we've got lots of evidence to support this, is that some antibiotics 100% absolutely impair mitochondrial function. They are targeting proteins molecules that are part of mitochondrial mitochondria and are critical to mitochondrial function and they are disrupting that that is how they kill the bacteria or stop bacterial growth and in the same way they can sometimes disrupt mitochondrial function so some might ask well what does that mean chris palmer what does that mean for your theory 
And I just want to point out, it is right on the package inserts of many antibiotics that they can cause severe depression, suicidality, mania, psychosis, and many other mental symptoms. Symptoms of very serious mental illness. Right on the package insert of numerous antibiotics. Right now, the field can't answer why do these antibiotics cause all of these different mental symptoms. The brain energy theory gives one very clear, coherent, logical, provable, testable theory that connects all of those dots. I think at this point, it's time to move into treatment. And we've talked about Tom's example, and we know diet is a piece piece of this, ketogenic diet in his case. But let's take a typical type patient. We know that right now, depression is causing the greatest amount of disability worldwide. So let's let's use that as our example. I'm sure that's a common thing that you'd see in a patient. And let's talk about somebody who is moderately affected by that. And let's just use this as a hypothetical to talk about what treatment could look like when you're working with somebody using the brain energy theory. The first thing that I would want to do with the person, moderate depression, let's hope for, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to throw in some disclaimers or caveats. I'm going to assume no life-threatening symptoms. So no suicidality, no suicide attempts, no self-injury, no heavy alcohol use or other substance use um, that's at least endangering their life. Um, so bread and butter, simple, quote unquote, sim- at least for me, simple case of moderate depression. Um, the first thing I would want to do is I would, the, the treatment strategies kind of fall into two buckets. Bucket number one is we're going to identify all the things that are harming your metabolism or mitochondria. And we're going to make a list of those things, and we're going to do our best to try to address them. Bucket number two is we're going to think about strategies that we can develop that will enhance your metabolism or improve the health and number of mitochondria in your cells, because that will help you get better. The treatments are going to include biological, psychological, and social factors. So I I didn't say this at the outset, but the very first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to assess whether this, this person's depression is a normal human response to adversity or if this person's depression is really a brain disorder, a metabolic brain disorder. It's a big difference. So the easy example I'll give everyone, if this is a man coming to me who says, I'm moderately depressed, doc, please help. And I ask him, like, what's happened? What's going on? Oh, my wife just three days ago let me know that she's divorcing me and she's taking custody of the kids. She she has a new lover, and they're moving out of state. I'm going to say, well, yeah, you are depressed. <laughs> and, like, of course you're depressed. Who wouldn't be depressed in that situation? And the treatment of choice for that particular individual <clears throat> is going to be talk therapy, more than likely. That person needs support. That person needs family support, community support. Um, he might need a good lawyer. <laughs> he, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the treatments are common sense things. I'm also with that, with that particular patient, I'm also going to make sure that he doesn't start engaging in behaviors that are going to cause him to fall off a cliff. So it's going to be natural that he's going to say, I can't sleep well, so I'm drinking alcohol to try to sleep. I'm going to talk with him about, no, no, let's let's get rid of that habit right now. Let's nip this in the bud before this becomes a really serious problem. Because it is understandable, it is common for a person in that situation to start using a lot more alcohol to try to stop their thinking or to their anxiety or to try to help them sleep. 
Unfortunately, alcohol is going to make everything worse. It's going to make their mental symptoms worse, and it's going to make the situation worse. And, um, you know, the person might go off a, an otherwise healthy diet. The person might stop exercising. They might start, you know, doing all sorts of things that are just not going to be good for them. So that's how I'm going to help that person. But that person's having a normal reaction to adversity. If I if if we're talking about somebody else who says I don't know why I'm depressed. I've been depressed like this for 3 years and I have a really good life. I don't know what's wrong with me. Like I have a great job, a great family, great everything, but for I just can't snap out of it. I'm just so depressed. I don't know what's wrong with me. So two buckets. I'm going to look for all of the things that are harming this person's metabolism. I'm going to ask him about drug and alcohol use. I'm going to ask him how their sleep is. I'm going to ask him about medication use. I'm looking for medications that might be harming metabolism. I am, and harming mitochondria in particular, uh, I am going to um, ask about exercise, Ask about meaning and purpose in life. Again, it's not just biological. I'm going to look at psychological and social things. I'm going to ask about a history of trauma, any trauma symptoms, all of those kind of things. And if this person identifies two or three things that I think are harming his metabolism, we're going to first work to address those. So you're you're drinking a lot of alcohol. So that's going to be step one. Let's let's get you off the alcohol. Let's let's see if we can go a month with no alcohol and just see what effect it has on your mood. For some people, treatment begins and ends there. That's it. Alcohol, one month later, I'm not depressed anymore, doc. Wow. Who knew? Well, now treatment is... Do you think you can keep it up? Maybe maybe you should just not drink at all. Like maybe maybe this is a new healthy way to be. Maybe let's go, you know, a few months without alcohol. Some people won't buy into that. They'll, oh, I've got to drink. I have to drink. Doc, come on. You can't, you can't, you're killing me. What's the point in being alive if I don't get a drink? So if that's what the person's saying, then I'm going to work with that person to try to figure out, okay, let's, as you reintroduce alcohol into your life, let's really pay attention to those depression symptoms and make sure that they're not coming back. And then you're going to have to weigh the, the pros and cons of, do you want to drink and be depressed? Or do you want to maybe be sober and non-depressed? That might be your choice. Or can we find the right balance of maybe you can get away with one or two drinks, one or two times a week, and that is okay for you. Um, and so I'm going to do that with all of these other factors. If we identify some factors that are impairing the person's metabolism, get rid of them, and the person is still depressed, then I'm going to start looking at, let's maybe change your diet, use dietary strategies to improve your mitochondrial function. Um, I'm going to maybe start a more rigorous exercise program. So even if this person says, well, I, I exercise like twice a week, you know, I go for a run, maybe one or two miles at most. I'm going to be like, let's up your game. Let's up the exercise game because exercise is going to improve metabolic health, mitochondrial health, and that might help your depression. Um, so I'm going to kind of do both strategies remove offending problems and, you know, implement things that are going to improve metabolic health. And when it comes to the diet piece, we know the ketogenic diet is a piece of this, at least for some people. Does it always have to be that extreme to help fix metabolic health or is there an in-between for people? No, it absolutely does not. So for some people, if they're eating a lot of, really depends on what the baseline diet is. It also depends on what symptoms people are having. Um, you know, if somebody is having chronic psychotic symptoms, diagnosed with schizophrenia, I have not found other dietary interventions to be very effective. I'll say that up front. Um, so I probably am going to use the ketogenic diet with that person if they come to me saying, I want my voices and delusions to go away. But for other people, it can be as simple as, Step one, let's clean up your diet a little bit. Let's eliminate processed junk food. If this person is eating a lot of sweets, things with added sugar, 
whether it's candy or sodas or whatever. Let's see if we can get rid of the sugar. Maybe that's step one. Get rid of the sugar or at least reduce the sugar. Reduce the sugar to one or two times a week. Maybe on the weekends, if you go out to dinner, you can have it then. But let's just reduce sugar. See what impact we get. For If that doesn't work, we might then transition more toward a kind of a whole food, real diet. So, um, and there are lots of versions of this. Some people like whole food plant-based diet, other people like paleo diet, other people like, you know, they're all whole 30. I mean, there are all sorts of versions of whole food diets. A lot of them are really effective for different people. So I don't think there's a one size fits all, but I would probably go more for a whole foods diet. So let's start getting rid of foods that are processed, um, foods that you can't find in nature, foods with ingredients that you don't, you can't pronounce. Um, let's get rid of all that stuff. And, and then I would progress, um, you know, might go more toward paleo, then might start going more toward low carb, then might start going toward ketogenic if needed. One word I haven't heard you use yet when we're talking about diet is calories. So that leads me to believe at least a big piece of this is the composition and quality of food versus the amount of food. Talk about that. You know, right now, so many people are focused. There are still a lot of people who are focused on calories. Like, all you got to do is count your calories and that'll take care of your weight and your metabolic health. The sad reality is like that we are losing the battle and everybody's heard that for decades. Everybody has heard for decades. All you got to do is count your calories. And if you are capable of counting, you will not be overweight. It's really that simple. And in my mind, that is the ultimate fat shaming message. That if you're overweight, you must be really stupid and incapable of counting calories. That somehow you're just not doing the right math. And and in fact, when the human body is functioning optimally, and this includes the human brain, when the human body and brain are functioning optimally, people's weight will regulate itself. They won't need to count calories. The overwhelming majority of thin people or normal weight people on the planet or athletic people on the planet, they are not counting calories. Their brain tells them when to eat and their brain tells them when not to eat and their brain tells them when to stop. Um, And it's that simple. And what I would argue based on this overarching brain energy theory is that when we eat foods that contain unnatural ingredients, such as high fructose corn syrup or trans fatty acids, which thankfully are now outlawed in the United States, but I use those two examples because we have very good evidence for both. Both of them impair mitochondrial function. They disrupt the normal signals they, that, that control feeding behaviors. If you eat a lot of those foods, you will feel hungrier and or your metabolism will change so that even if you eat the same number of calories that you used to eat, now your metabolism is plummeting and you're not burning those calories as effectively. And that means the weight is piling up. But at the same time the weight is piling up, your metabolism broadly is also impaired. That means you're you're more likely to develop diabetes. It also means you're more likely to develop brain malfunction, brain metabolic dysfunction. And that means you might start having symptoms of mental illness. So I don't talk about calories for the most part with almost any of my patients, I am much more focused on trying different dietary patterns that will reestablish normal metabolic health. And once people are metabolically healthy, their weight will usually take care of itself. And 
although that sounds like maybe people think I'm wishful thinking or I'm living in some fairy tale land. What? I have patients with schizophrenia who've lost 160 pounds and kept it off. We didn't focus on calories once. We never talked about calories. I have other patients who've lost 70 pounds, 100 pounds, whatever. We never talked about calories. So what I'm saying, at least in my experience and my hands and the way I administer it, it produces real results. I know people are like, well, I want to lose weight, so I need to count calories. I'm what I'm telling you is no, you 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 don't need to count calories. You need to restore your metabolic health. And once you do that, then your weight will take care of itself. And I think it's important to point out at this point too that weight is typically something that is gonna move up and down with metabolic dysfunction, as in you gain more weight and you're gonna have more metabolic dysfunction. But for people out there that are using that as their only barometer to whether or not they have metabolic dysfunction, you can still be skinny and your mitochondria can be suffering. Yes. So talk about if you've seen that and, and a little bit more on the nuances there. So we see it all the time. So again, a lot of, but I think you're right. A lot of people think of metabolic health as you're either overweight or not. And if you're overweight, then that means you're metabolically unhealthy. And if you're un if you're normal weight or underweight, then you're fine. And that's not at all the way it works. And you can have regions in your brain that are metabolically compromised, and you can still be a normal weight. And um, so I would argue that if you are having symptoms of a mental illness, but again, not a normal reaction to adversity. So I'm not talking about the, the guy whose wife is leaving him being depressed. That is normal. That has nothing to do with metabolic dysfunction in his brain. That has to do with his wife is leaving him and he's understandably depressed. But for people who have symptoms of a metabolic brain disorder, meaning panic attacks, unrelenting depression for no reason, hallucinations, delusions, bipolar symptoms, whatever, um, those symptoms alone tell me as a neuroscientist that person's brain is metabolically malfunctioning. And, um, and that is important information on its own because whether, regardless of what the person weighs. Um, so I think that you know, in some ways, this theory, the metabolic theory of mental illness, adds, it simplifies the mental health field in ridiculous ways. It gives people with mental, chronic mental disorders hope and practical, implementable, understandable strategies to improve their symptoms, put their illnesses into remission and move on with life. The unfortunate news for the metabolic health community, people who are focused on obesity, if people who are focused on obesity think that the obesity epidemic can be solved with math, they, people just need to count their calories and eat less calories, and that'll take care of our obesity epidemic. What I'm here to say is you don't get it at all. And you don't understand science at all. You don't understand tens of thousands of research articles that have been published. So, so my message in some way simplifies the mental health field because the mental health field has been so complicated and ineffective for a lot of people. But it does make the metabolic health field a little more complicated. <laughs> and, and it but it but it all makes common sense. So it means that if somebody has trauma, we know that trauma victims are more likely to go on to develop not just mental illness, not just PTSD, but actually a wide variety of other mental disorders, depression, anxiety, personality disorders, but even bipolar and schizophrenia. But those people are also more likely to go on to develop obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Those people are more likely to die early deaths. And so what I'm saying is that in order to understand metabolic health, 
We need to, to unite the mental health field and the metabolic health field together. And that's going to make the metabolic health field a little more complicated for some people who think it's all about counting calories. That's, I guess, that's my wake-up call to them. <laughs> Riffing off of something you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, and I got this from reading your book, that the brain is like the canary in the coal mine. So this ties back to when we were talking about obesity and the connection to metabolic health. You can almost use mental symptoms as a sign of metabolic dysfunction because that is one of the first areas to go when our metabolism is compromised. Absolutely. So a lot of people talk about, a lot of people think metabolic health can be measured. Like you can measure your insulin levels or you can measure your glucose levels. And if your glucose is normal and your insulin is normal, then that means you're normal because you don't have insulin resistance. And yes, insulin and glucose are important biomarkers, and yes, measure them by all means, and if they are abnormal, it tells you that you are metabolically unhealthy. But precisely what you said, I'm arguing if somebody is having chronic, unexplainable mental symptoms, like anxiety or depression or panic attacks or trauma symptoms or psychotic, psychotic symptoms, if somebody is having those symptoms, that is a quote-unquote biomarker, even though we can't measure, it's not really a biomarker because we can't measure it. We have to trust people to tell us it, so it's really a symptom. But I think of it as a biomarker of impending metabolic dysfunction. That is the first sign. It is the first thing to show itself. And when we see, when we hear about that from a patient, we need to think differently about that patient. We need to now think this person's brain is metabolically malfunctioning. And if we don't take care of this soon, this person is at high risk of developing all sorts of other mental disorders, which is true but they're also much more likely to develop all of the metabolic disorders, which is absolutely true. We've got lots of research to support that. And they're also more likely to die early deaths. Um, that is true too. So absolutely. Mental symptoms are the canary in the coal mine for a lot of people. We need to take them more seriously. The great news is that if we intervene, in a metabolic way, we're also going to prevent all of those bad things that I just said. We're going to prevent them from developing obesity and diabetes and heart attacks and having premature death. We're going to help them live happier, healthier, longer lives. They're going to cost the medical system a lot less money. They're going to be less likely to be disabled. They're going to be taxpaying citizens. They're going to be living their lives with meaning and purpose. Like the system is going to win. This is a win-win, folks. This is a win-win. It is not going to cost the system more money. It's going to save the system money. For somebody that's been listening and they're buying into what we're talking about today and they're saying, okay, I'm excited. I'm going to give this a try. But I've been affected by, say, depression for 30 years. And you talked about the example there of, you know, life factors, things that happen, and that being a more transient uh, example and a different example than somebody who is suffering from depression but can't really pinpoint the reason. So using an example of, quote, unquote, real depression, what's the prognosis like when you work with people that have been suffering for a longer period of time, say 20, 30 years versus somebody who is only say six months, a year into it? Do they recover quicker if they get to this sooner? And is there a possibility for a bigger full recovery with more acute cases versus chronic? The real answer is that even when I see people with chronic mental disorders, I, if they are able to do like the dietary strategies and some of the other strategies, I actually see 
remarkably high remission rates even in them, even with chronic schizophrenia or chronic bipolar disorder, certainly chronic depression like you described. The, the, the couple of caveats to that, and there are a few caveats that make the chronic person, the person who's been suffering for 30 years, that make, there are a few things that are going to make it harder to treat that individual. The first one is addiction. The longer somebody has a mental disorder, the more likely they are to get addicted to substances of abuse. They're much more likely to start smoking cigarettes and be addicted to that or vaping and be addicted to that, or use marijuana or use alcohol. And so if I'm dealing with somebody who's got a chronic disorder and they also have comorbid addictions on top of it, it makes the treatment harder to do and harder to, to, to stick with for those people. So that's kind of one of the differences. Possibly the bigger difference is when somebody's been severely depressed for 20 or 30 years, they have often lost so much in their life. A lot of them are disabled now. They've lost their career. And that career is gone. Maybe they never even had a career. But if they did, it's gone. I have patients like that. They became severely depressed, engineer, used to have a great job. When you're disabled for 20 years and you haven't worked as an engineer in 20 years, you can't go back to that as your job. Not without a lot of training. You'd probably have to go back to school. You'd probably even have to get a new de new degree or something, or at least take training courses. And Some of them have also lost relationships. When you're chronically depressed for 20 or 30 years, there's a good chance, there's a higher probability at least, that your spouse has divorced you, if you ever even had a spouse. If you never had a spouse, there's a good chance you never even had a boyfriend or girlfriend, significant other. If, if you do have, say, a family, your family is often disgusted with you. They just think of you as like a lazy, incompetent blob. So you, you've lost their respect. All of those things are harder to get back. So if I can, if, if, if let's say the person doesn't have a serious addiction and I implement diet, lifestyle, exercise, strategies, and I get that person dramatically better in six months, which I think is very possible. Now I've got a metabolically and mentally healthy person, but they still have an uphill battle. Now they have to find a, a purpose in life. They have to think about, are, am I going to go off disability? What kind of a job could I get? How much will that job pay? Is that job going to pay as much as disability pays me? Because if it doesn't, I can't afford to lose even more money. I can't afford to go work for minimum wage somewhere if my disability check is more than my minimum wage job will pay me. And if they don't have job training, if they haven't worked in 20 years, it makes it really challenging. If they don't have relationships, that makes it really challenging. Because helping them be less depressed or even not depressed at all 
doesn't give them an automatic social group. Now they have to go through the work of trying to find a social group, trying to find somewhere to fit in. And unfortunately, society is not kind to people who have been disabled for 20 or 30 years. That one of the first questions everyone asks you, if you go to a group to meet people, say you go to a meetup group and just try to hang out with, make some new friends, one of the first questions they're going to ask you is, what do you do? And if your answer is, oh, I've been depressed and disabled for 20 or 30 years, it just doesn't make you a lot of friends, unfortunately. So I do have to acknowledge that these are real issues and real challenges that to this day I am working on with some of my patients who I'm helping them get better. They're restoring their brain function And now we have to try to figure out how can you fit into society again? Where are you going to fit? How are you going to make friends? How are you going to start dating if that's important to you? Can can we teach you the skills to live independently? Because again, it's not just brain function. You have to know how to pay bills and how how to manage your affairs and do all your grocery shopping by yourself and everything else. And if you've had people taking care of you Um, because you've been disabled, it can be rough. So I want to, sadly, I I know that's kind of a downer. I will say this. I would so much rather be helping patients with all of those tasks than listening to them complain about how they're depressed and suicidal week after week, how their voices are tormenting them, how the delusions are tormenting them. I would much, much, much rather be dealing with these other problems of how am I going to help you now develop a meaningful life? How am I going to help you integrate yourself into society again? But this is one of the things I'm calling for and and kind of my call to action is that we need treatment programs and systems that are going to help these people. Like once we help them recover, once we restore their brain health, Now we need to help them reintegrate themselves into society. That's such a good point. And from somebody in my shoes, it's a whole perspective. And I'm glad you went into that because only somebody in your shoes seeing, you know, these people recover firsthand would realize that there's this whole other aspect of recovery and re-ingraining themselves back into an old lifestyle, or if it's been going on for long enough, a new lifestyle that they've never actually had. So very important. I'm glad you went into that. Thanks. Yeah. So we really went into the diet piece. We know the ketogenic diet is is a starting place, at least for people that are more severe with their mental health challenges. How do you feel about supplements? And I want to caveat this and say that we're talking about supplements that go along with that diet we already talked about. So we're not using them as a replacement to continue our crappy diet from before, but if we're going to make the dietary changes and then try and fill holes with supplements or specific supplements that we can take to help with mitochondrial health, how do you feel about supplements? I will say this. It is early days right now in terms of rigorous research showing benefits. There are lots of supplements. I I went through a whole laundry list of supplement names um, in the book on supplements that are touted to improve mitochondrial health or help with mitochondrial health. We, we've had some research studies with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or chronic depression um, where without changing anything else, without changing diet, keeping people on medications that cause metabolic harm, that giving people supplements, even like 20 supplements all at the same time, does not seem to work. That's the bottom line of that. So supplements on their own will not fix metabolic problems as a rule of thumb. Obviously, if somebody has a nutritional deficiency or a hormone, a hormone deficiency, that can be the game changer. So if you 
are found to have vitamin B12 deficiency, for instance. A B12 supplement or shot or pill could be, like, be your magic bullet. Um, Want to say that up front. But there was just a study published the other day of three mitochondrial supplements in people with Alzheimer's disease, and it improved their cognition. Um, that is not really happening in medication trials for Alzheimer's disease. So, so I think there is so much research to be done in this area. Which supplements, how much of those supplements, for whom, how long, um, all of those things that I, I think there are so many exciting possibilities for appropriate um, use of supplements with some patients in some phases of recovery, no doubt about it. And I'm actually really excited about some of those supplements and some of the early data on them. But the, the caution that I just want to say, because I get asked this a lot. So tell me what, because at the end of the day, everybody likes just taking a pill and thinking that's going to solve their problem. So they ask me exactly this question. So Chris Palmer, if it's, if it's a mitochondrial problem, tell me what pill I can take to fix my mitochondria. And, and they, they want a supplement. They want a mitochondrial supplement. CoQ10, that's supposed to be good for your mitochondria. So if I take CoQ10, that'll fix my schizophrenia, right? Wrong. Let me be clear. Wrong. Doesn't work. It's actually been tried. Does not work. So do not think that the majority of, of kind of situations, like exercise is something that enhances mitochondrial function. We don't have a supplement that mimics all of the benefits of exercise. We don't have exercise in a pill. So no, people shouldn't expect to see um, all of the metabolic benefits in one pill. Very good explanation there. And I get where you're coming from. But for somebody who is dealing with a mental health challenge, just as a core handful of supplements just to support general health during recovery and beyond, do you have like a certain three or four supplements that you'd recommend to people, whether it be fish oil, vitamin D, probiotic, things that are really general to fill in possible gaps? And if you don't, that's fine. I just want to, I understand where you're coming from before, but do you have something that's kind of like a bread and butter baseline supplement pack? Bread and butter, I would say, if you're starting a diet, especially something like the ketogenic diet, take a multivitamin, a, a good bioavailable multivitamin. Let's start with that. Um, omega-3 fatty acids. We know that omega-3 fatty acids play a really important role in mitochondrial function, actually. They are integrated primarily in mitochondrial membranes, not the cell membrane. So um, so when you take omega-3 fatty acids, it is primarily for your mitochondria and their health. However, we just got this like a year or two ago, we just got this really large randomized controlled trial of giving middle-aged adults a fish oil supplement to see if it would prevent depression in them. And the bottom line is it did not work, unfortunately. So. Although I want to say, sure, why not? Go ahead and everybody take fish oil. The data actually suggests it may or may not, you know, it may not be as beneficial as we had hoped. Instead, for omega-3 fatty acids, I would highly, highly recommend fatty fish, salmon, on a regular basis, um, at least once or twice a week, and that will probably help you get your omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I do think it's hard for me to recommend, but, um, you know, some of the NAD supplements, so there are precursors to NAD, NMN, um, nicotinamide riboside, and some other ones. Um, there are lots of versions of this. Those do appear to improve mitochondrial health. Um, they also appear to improve kind of gene regulation and genetic health. Um, 
But again, I've seen a couple of disappointing study outcomes with some of those molecules that they've given those supplements to people, for instance, with fatty liver disease, and it it didn't seem to work, unfortunately. You would think it would, but it didn't. And that that's why I kind of said what I said before. I think the bigger money is to do the real medical kind of workup of what's causing the problem, let's address it, uh, and then let's implement some broad lifestyle factors like exercise and diet, which are going to be so much more powerful than any supplement could ever be. So you mentioned fish there. Fish aside, any other specific foods, no matter what diet paradigm somebody's well, I guess not whatever, because if they're vegan or vegetarian, they're not going to be into fish. But specific foods that people want to include that are really good for brain health? Eggs are really good if you're, you know, even if you're a lacto-ovo vegetarian, that might be. Eggs are great. Um, They have choline and iron and all sorts of things. You want to make sure you're getting adequate protein. Uh, and there's all sorts of controversy about how much protein do people need. But we know that muscle mass, if you have muscle on your body, that means you have more mitochondria in your muscle cells. And those mitochondria are actually sending all sorts of metabolic signals throughout your body that impact your brain. So people who have more muscle mass are going to be have healthier brains they are also more likely to live longer lives and they actually have higher survival rates from cancer treatment for instance um if they do develop cancer they're much more likely to not die from cancer so all sorts of benefits from muscle mass um and it doesn't mean you have to go out and be a big bodybuilder and women don't worry i'm not asking you to look like arnold schwarzenegger um but trying to improve your muscle tone or muscle mass is good And that requires protein. For better or worse, you're not going to build muscle with anything other than protein. Um, Fruits and vegetables. So definitely, especially if if you're doing like even a ketogenic diet, you can still have fruits and vegetables. Those are really good for gut health. Um, They result in uh, short-chain fatty acids which actually serve as a fuel source for the mitochondria in your gut cells. The cells lining your gut, specific, that's why short-chain fatty acids are all the rage. If you get more granular and specific, they end up in mitochondria in your gut cells, and that helps your gut cells be healthier. And that means your gut is less permeable, you're less likely to have a leaky gut, It helps those gut cells send the appropriate endocrine signals that they are supposed to be sending up to your brain, all sorts of things. Um, 95% of the serotonin is produced in the gut, um, and that is probably playing a role in depression and anxiety disorders. So uh, gut health is important, and, and then that gets into the microbiome. So... I would I would say fruits and vegetables broadly. Which ones? I mean, it, it starts getting because then it starts getting on what kind of a diet are you trying to do? Because again, there it's a balancing act of if I'm trying to be keto for the benefits that a ketogenic diet can confer, that might mean that some fruits and vegetables I'm not going to be able to eat, and it doesn't mean that those fruits and vegetables aren't good for anyone else. If another person doesn't need keto, some people might be thriving on a paleo diet, for instance, and they should be eating potatoes, and they can be eating all the fruits and vegetables and all sorts of things that they want, and that's all good. So it's hard to make universal diet recommend food recommendations. I hear you. And for somebody who is suffering mentally, in the severe category, and they've gone to the ketogenic diet as a way to help them recover. Is that a cyclical ketogenic diet? Or typically, does that person need to be on ketogenic 24 seven? How do you how do you work with that? I use the ketogenic diet like the epilepsy field uses it. And that means that at least for the first two years, 
I'm looking for ketogenic diet 24 um, seven. What I have, I and I will tell you just from my own experience, I have seen patients with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, who have essentially had dramatic remission of illness on a ketogenic diet. And like five months in, they actually become convinced, I'm fine now. I don't need this diet anymore. I'm cured. I'm all set. They go off the diet. And within 24 to 48 hours, their psychosis is back. Or they're having a severe mood symptom. They're they're having severely depressed or manic or something. So, um, and that's what they find in the epilepsy field as well. In the epilepsy field, um, patients are usually told you've got to do this for a minimum of two years because if you break the diet, there's a good chance your seizures will come back with a vengeance within 24 to 48 hours. Um, However, once people do the diet for two years, and the range in the neurology field is usually two to five years, the clinician will help We'll work with the patient and the dietitian to figure out, okay, how long should this particular patient be on the diet? And they're going to base it on other symptoms that you've been having, whether your seizures are all the way gone or not, all, all sorts of things. <clears throat> but you, for most people, they can stop the diet after two to five years. They don't even have to do cyclical anymore. They can stop the ketogenic diet and maintain all of the benefits that they got. That the ketogenic diet results in permanent increases and improvement in mitochondrial function in those brain cells. And once we do that kind of quote unquote reset, you can think of it as a reset for those brain cells, that we are improving the metabolic health in those brain cells. And once those brain cells are metabolically healthy, they can you can eat a regular diet and maintain that health for potentially your lifetime. So a lot of those people, um, you know, a lot of people in the neurology field will do it for two to five years. Right now in the mental health field, we don't have enough data and and enough people for me to be able to give clear recommendations on that, unfortunately. But I'm I'm hoping that for most of them, it will end up being this two to five year thing. I've certainly had some patients, most of them don't go completely like, Most of them don't go to an awful standard American diet when they get off, but a lot of them can go to something more like a paleo diet or they they start getting carbs and they're clearly not in ketosis anymore and they can be thriving. They can do extraordinarily well. Um, But it's usually like, you know, they've been on the ketogenic diet for three or more years already. So we've went deep into the diet piece. We've talked about supplements, but now I want to get into when we eat. So time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting, how does that play into things with patients and their mitochondrial health? So fasting and intermittent fasting can play a role for some people. Um, For some people, it can actually be a really important part of treatment. It can, it's a strategy to increase ketones. So when I'm working with patients who are really, um, who have come to me with a serious mental illness, such as hallucinations, delusions, serious mood symptoms. Um, if, If they go off the diet or if they get stressed or they're not sleeping well or something happens and their ketone levels go down and their symptoms are coming back with a vengeance, Um, And we see that direct correlation, like your symptoms are coming back with a vengeance. Oh, and your ketones are down. Sometimes I will have them do an intermittent fast or a fast to, that that is the most rapid way to um, elevate ketones. For other people, um, I've talked with some clinicians who simply implement kind of more paleo diet, plus or minus intermittent fasting. Like, let's see if you can just have two meals a day. Um, Eat as much as you want at those meals, but two meals a day with paleo diet or two meals a day with a low-ish carb diet. Um, I have some patients who, as part of their ketogenic diet routine, will typically skip one or two meals. They'll only eat, you know, one or two meals a day. Um, And so I, 
The good news is that there are lots of variations. You can work with people, find out what's doable for them, find out what makes the diet easier, and balance that with what clinical benefits are you looking for and how are the best ways that you can achieve those clinical benefits. So there's no one size fits all. Chris, I know you got to go. We're going to end on this. So we did talk about supplements, but I want to talk about exogenous ketones. So what I'm getting at here, is this something you recommend? And the reason I ask it, I'm curious how much of the role of the ketogenic diet comes from the ketones that it produces having that positive effect on metabolic health? It's an important question. There are studies getting underway looking at exogenous ketones for a variety of mental and neurological disorders and also metabolic health conditions. The simple answer for me is that to date, we I'm not aware of any, any human being who has been able to stop their seizures using exogenous ketones. And so the ketogenic diet is a 100-year-old evidence-based treatment for epilepsy, and yet we don't have even one case report of anybody being able to stop their seizures simply by drinking ketones. Um, And the reason that's important to me as a psychiatrist is because we use epilepsy treatments all the time. So the fact that exogenous ketones don't stop seizures strongly suggests to me that exogenous ketones may not stop mental symptoms. I can tell you I have tried exogenous ketones in many patients of mine, and they have not worked. They have not done the miracle things that we all hoped they would do. It's a small number of patients, and that's why I talked about that other, my kind of my logic. is we, There's not even one human example of anybody stopping their seizures. So I would say exogenous ketones may definitely play a role. And there are many uses that we can think about using them in terms of diagnostic testing, in terms of augmenting low-carbohydrate or ketogenic diets for people who can't get their ketones up. Possibly, you know, there are the benefits in terms of performance, mental benefits. Lots of health and wellness gurus are drinking ketones these days and swear by them. So I'm not against exogenous ketones. I'm excited about more research on them, but I don't think they are the magic bullet that everybody hoped they might be. All right, Chris, I'm going to let you go. The book is Brain Energy. I'm going to link it up in the show notes. We're going to link up your social media, your website, everything. Love the book. Love this conversation. And this message you're getting out to the world is just so inspirational, positive. Um, it's, It's really simple when it comes down to the essence of it. And I thank you for the work you're doing and thank you for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Now that you're done my conversation with Chris, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Dale, where you're going to learn even more about how to optimize your brain health. I'll see you over there. The problem with Alzheimer's has been that people have been treating it blindly. They get a small data set. They say, we don't know what causes this.